10 of his Wichita neighbors between 1974 and 1991. Andrei Chikatilo terrorizes Russia for 12 years, targeting children. He removes his victims' eyes, cuts out their organs, eats their flesh. The killer clown, John Wayne Gacy Jr., targets teenage boys in Chicago. He tortures and kills his victims, then buries them in his basement. Why do they behave in a manner that could be rationally described as evil? A person who tortures and murders somebody else and has no rationale for doing it. What kind of a person is that? What kind of a person would do such a thing? Science has long avoided the concept of evil, until now. Evil is a hard nut to crack, but I think if we identify the pieces of the machinery that make up the evil individual, we'll be on the path, ultimately, towards stopping evil in society. Researchers from across the country are now exploring the factors that may lead to extreme violence. These people are not like so many cigars in a cigar box, you know, each one of which is identical to the other 49 in the box. They're a collection of unique persons. What distinguishes these killers from the rest of us? Could we be capable of evil? What is it that makes somebody violent? Dr. Jonathan Pincus is chief of neurology at the VA hospital in Washington, DC. Uh, I've seen well over 100 murderers in the course of my career, and I've examined them thoroughly. He believes he knows the recipe to create a violent criminal. We've done a lot of work, and I think it's these three things. Abuse, brain damage, and mental illness. Could this combination of three factors, abuse, mental illness, and brain damage and dysfunction, intersect to create a killer? The lives of the most notorious killers will be explored to see if his theory explains their brutal acts, starting with the first ingredient, brain damage. The brains of killers are damaged in ways that produce a person who is not able to inhibit his impulses. If he thinks of doing something, he's more likely to do it. If he's doing something, he's less likely to change it. If the area of the brain that controls impulse is damaged, can it lead to murder? On August 1st, 1966, a 25-year-old man named Charles Whitman gets up, buys a gun, then climbs the University of Texas clock tower. For 96 minutes, he shoots as many people as he can, killing 15 people and wounding 31 others before being shot and killed by police. On that fateful day, Charles Whitman shows an unrestrained urge to kill. He seems to lose control. After Charles Whitman's shooting rampage, police find a suicide note. I don't really understand myself these days. Supposed to be an average, reasonable, and intelligent young man. However, lately, I can't recall when it started. I have been a victim of many unusual and irrational thoughts. In his note, Whitman requests that his brain be studied. Was Whitman's mind impaired? During his autopsy, doctors find a brain tumor. If a tumor affected the area of Whitman's brain that controls impulse, then some scientists believe it could have influenced his bout of rage. My finger goes up, look at my finger, and then right back at my nose. Good. Good. Dr. Pincus studies the area of the brain that controls impulse and aggression, the frontal lobe. You can get neurological dysfunction from a head injury, from brain tumor. You can get neurological dysfunction from being drunk or being intoxicated with something other than alcohol. Infection, there are hosts of different causes of brain injury and that produces changes in the person's capacity to exert judgment. Okay, just relax. He uses simple neurological tests to determine if there is dysfunction in the frontal lobe. One of the tests I do is visual tracking. A large portion of the frontal lobe is involved in visual tracking. The frontal eye fields. And the person should be able to follow my finger, which is moving slowly. Very good. Good. 
But if his eyes don't follow my finger, then that would be abnormal visual tracking, and it would indicate that there was something wrong with his frontal lobe. If there is damage, it could influence impulse control, and in extreme cases like Charles Whitman, lead to violence. Other killers show distinct brain abnormalities. When the killer clown John Wayne Gacy Jr. was 11, he was hit with a swing which prompted a series of blackouts. A blood clot was found in his brain five years later at age 16. Gacy murdered 33 teenage boys in Chicago in the 1970s and then buried them underneath his house. Arthur Shawcross is one of the most notorious living serial killers. He killed two children, then served 14 years in prison. After his release in 1987, he strangled 11 prostitutes in Rochester, New York. And in some cases, he ate their remains. Could brain damage have influenced his spree? He claimed to have had frequent head injuries growing up. First time I was 15. Well, in high school, when I got struck here in the, the, discus. the discus, I know when I got struck, I pulled my hands down and blood all over my face, and I just went, boom, gone. His brain scans did show a cyst in his right temporal lobe. Dr. Pincus is the neurologist who identified this cyst in Shawcross's brain. He believes that brain damage is one ingredient in the recipe to create a killer. But there is another factor that can lead the mind towards violence. And a potential killer may not even realize it. Somebody's killing everybody. Well, but it didn't dawn on me that I was doing. What makes a murderer? Is there a formula to create a serial killer? Dr. Jonathan Pincus is a neurologist who has studied hundreds of killers. He believes he knows the recipe. Three categories are critical. The first is brain damage, which impairs a person's judgment. Mental illness is another category. Almost everyone I've seen has been mentally ill. The link between mental illness and murder is illustrated with rare but shocking cases. In 1975, a Philadelphia cobbler named Joseph Callinger heard God's voice telling him to kill his own son, then enlisted his other son in the brutal torture of 10 others. And in 1993, in a Pennsylvania Amish community, Ed Gingrich claimed to be possessed by the devil he was convinced his wife was trying to poison him. So he beat and disemboweled her. He is the only Amish person ever convicted of a homicide. But even more gruesome than Callinger and Gingrich, Ed Gein. Gein lives in an isolated home in Wisconsin, dominated by his severe mother. For nearly 40 years, he spends every day with her, reading from the scriptures. She dies in 1945, when Ed is 39 years old. He is devastated and alone. The first signs of mental illness appear. He begins hallucinating. He hears his mother talking to him and sees visions in the woods, vultures in the branches, faces in the leaves. He becomes obsessed with bringing his mother back to life. He begins to rob graves, scanning obituaries for older women who have just died. He harvests their skin to make clothes and lampshades their skulls to make bowls. His mental illness leads to delusions. He believes he is an instrument of God and that God is calling him to kill. Ed Gein murders a shopkeeper, an older woman who resembles his mother. 
When police search Gein's home, they find her decapitated body hanging upside down. Her head is in a burlap sack. Her heart cut out and stored in a plastic bag. The organs and bones of the dead litter his home. On his wall, the decaying faces of nine women. Under his bed, a box of severed noses. Every room in Ed Gein's house is filthy, except one. His mother's bedroom. Ed Gein was diagnosed as mentally ill and declared incompetent to stand trial. His story illustrates one challenge for forensic science. How do you diagnose madness? That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. And that's wrong. Dr. Paul Nestor is a professor of psychology at the University of Massachusetts. For years, he worked in a maximum security mental institution evaluating murderers for the court. When people behave violently, there's always a question, well, the person has lost their mind so that they are mad. And then on the other hand, there's this question of whether they are simply bad characters. I wanted to translate the mad versus bad distinction into a science. His challenge is to discern a severe symptom of mental illness, psychosis a state in which people can't distinguish between the real world and the imagined. Like Ed Gein, someone who is psychotic has hallucinations, delusions, and paranoia. But Ed Gein is an extreme example. For most cases, it's not as clear. After their arrest, killers can claim mental illness. You know, it was like I was there, but I was over here too. Yeah. Two different people. Like observing what was happening. Right. Serial killer Arthur Shawcross strangled 11 women. But just before these murders, he says he had a break from reality. I just felt numb. Uh -huh. Like I was in another state of mind. Yeah. I know when I was in Dunkin' Donuts down a quarter of a block from the house, cops would come in and they'd, they'd discuss it. You know, and I'd be sitting there drinking coffee or eating a donut or talking with a few of the people I associated with, but it, it didn't dawn on me, you know? It didn't dawn on me that I was doing it. The jury didn't believe his defense. He was found sane and guilty. Mental illness is a difficult diagnosis, only made by experts like Dr. Nestor, who rely on a battery of tests. I can't tell you how to match the cards, but I will tell you each time whether you are right or wrong. In each case, they are mixed up and you are to put them in the right order so that they make the most sensible story. The patient is given a set of cartoon frames. Most people can put these cartoon frames into an order that makes sense. In this case, playing with matches will start a fire that could get out of control and pose a danger for others. The arrangement shows the basic link between action and consequence. People with psychosis have difficulty